Okay, they always announce that so nobody can be taken by surprise. Uh, nice to see you. Thanks for coming to the first answer panel for Seekers Corner. And we had a couple of questions, which is very pleasing. Now, let me say hello and welcome to all the people who are hopefully going to be viewing this and uh, say who we've got here. We've got Glyn. Hello, Glyn. Hello there. Glyn's the reader at St. Mary's Church. And we've got Sarah. Who, yeah, who you may have seen in various guises, the uh, university chaplain and uh, what else? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. So, how... yeah, so my full time role is um, university chaplain, but I am also licensed to St. Mary's and Greenstead parishes and also Newtown as associate minister. So I do tend to pop up in possibly odd places. Hmm, unexpected places. <laughs> you also have something to do with citizen culture, so citizen, citizen. That's right, yeah. So I'm one of the co chairs of the Cultures to Citizens. Yeah, yeah. And Glenn, sorry, I, I just re introduced you as a reader at St. Mary's, but maybe you'd like to say a little bit about that because it's not a familiar title for very many people. Well, a reader is, is essentially a lay person, so I'm not ordained, but to uh, have some uh, training which um, then equips me uh, to lead services and to and to preach and well do other things that do, different readers do different things to be honest but that's mainly that's what I that's what I do but but the key thing is that yeah so I'm a lay person so in a sense kind of um, I don't know a different way in a different face from, from somebody who is perhaps full-time clergy. Yeah. But you also lead Bible and Bible groups, Bible study groups? Yeah, things like that, lead Bible studies, yeah. And, um, I've done a different things over the years, but, but predominantly leading services and preaching is the right. main thing I do. One person who uh, will not be on the panel uh, in 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 the flesh, so to speak, but who has sent in a video is Erwin, because he is on annual leave. But the questions were sent to the panelists to think about before uh, today's answer session. So Erwin was able to deal with them on a video and we'll use that video. Now, we've had two questions and uh, Let's kick off with the first one. And that is one about liturgical colours. Now, I've got a graphic here to share with you. So here is a representation of the liturgical colours in a wheel. And um, you can see there's an awful lot of green. And yeah, OK, so there's a funny cartoon about that as well, which I might throw up later. But um, you can see there are a number of different colours. And I wonder who would like to kick off talking about that one. Or maybe we should maybe we should play Erwin's video first. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay. Right, let's play the video, then we can speak to the video. Yeah, OK. Let's the try and do that Seekers without mishap. And the first one is, yeah. why do you keep changing the colours on your Facebook page? And what is ordinary time? Well, it's all to do with the Christian calendar. And there are two major seasons in that calendar. There is the season of Christmas, Christmas tide, and the season of Easter, Easter tide. And also there is a preparation time of these seasons or these festivals. Advent is the preparation for Christmas tide, and Lent is the preparation for Easter. Now, these two seasons have their own colours. So Easter and Christmas tide is white or gold and the preparation for these festivals is purple. Now in between, between Easter tide, the end of Easter tide and the beginning of Advent, there is that long season of ordinary time. Now ordinary time starts the Sunday after Pentecost. So Pentecost is the last Sunday of Easter tide. And then the first Sunday of ordinary time is Trinity Sunday. And that's the beginning when the um, hangings and all the colours change into green. And that could go on until the Sunday before Advent. So Pentecost is the last before we move on to ordinary time. 
And that's meaningful because Pentecost is the promise of the Holy Spirit. And we take, East, we take ordinary time until the beginning of Advent. So in fact, ordinary time is not that ordinary because it is living from the promise of the Holy Spirit and also looking forward to the Advent, the second Advent, the second coming of our Lord. Now, in the Church of England, there's a slight difficulty because the four weeks before Advent, you have the option to change your colours into red, and it's then called the Kingdom Seasons. But some churches just carry on with the green season until the Sunday before Advent. Now, there was one other thing that I wanted to say, well, indeed, that ordinary time is in fact an exercise in living your life everyday life as a Christian with that promise of the Holy Spirit but also looking forward to the second coming of Christ. I, like I hope that. that's clarifying. Glenn, I'm happy for you to go first and I'll add comments if there's anything that we haven't Yeah, I'm a bit of a fraud about liturgical courts because really it's not, it's not really something that I get terribly excited about but um, but I think, yeah, I think Erwin said some interesting things, think about ordinary time there, how, how we're living. It's not ordinary because we're living in the, in, the, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, power of the Holy Spirit, looking forward to, to the coming of, uh, of Jesus. So I think that was very, very powerful. I mean, we could also add, in terms of colours, we could talk about like uh, a Pentecost red being the, um, symbolizing the Holy Spirit and the power and the energy of the Holy Spirit as, as, uh, as the Holy Spirit appeared to the uh, first disciples um, in, as, as uh, tongues of fire. And so that's why it's, and it's also red is the core use uh, for things like confirmation, which is very much um, focused on the relationship between the, the the Holy Spirit and, uh, and the Christian. Um, and then, yeah, I think, it, I think the rhythm, uh, certainly the rhythm of the, of the year is important, I think. Um, but the colours, I don't know why, why is ordinary time green, for instance? <laughs> it's, uh, it, it goes back a long time, I think, to use of colours. Uh, and it was uh, apparently what I found is that it, they were in use in the fourth century, but applied rather uh, arbitrarily through the year. And then in the 12th century, Pope Innocent III, uh, he regularized their use. And uh, after the Reformation, the Lutheran and the Anglican churches just retained those colours. So they're still the same in the Catholic Church, too. But I, I have often wondered about uh, the connection between the particular colour and uh, what they uh, are used for. The, is there a religious significance to any of them? So... That's an interesting question, is it? Because I would then say purple is the colour of repentance. Mm. But I don't know why no. purple is the colour of repentance. And I was just thinking, um, as you were speaking, that actually maybe one of the reasons that ordinary time is green is that if you were dyeing stuff in the 12th century, would green be an easier colour to dye things? Would it have been a cheaper way of producing church fabric if you needed a lot of stuff that was green? Because gold and white, which are the colours of celebration, are obviously going to be gold thread and exquisite and expensive. But the ordinary time stuff, maybe the green fabrics were cheaper. I have no idea if that's an actual answer or not. It just felt like a plausible explanation. I thought I thought maybe there was something like that about green. So I started counting up all the times that we use green and all the other times we use different colours. And actually it comes out that green is used 28 uh, times and white or gold 37 times. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, well, I suppose that's... it's a colour of growth as well, isn't it? Yes. So we're talking about that season where we are anticipating uh, and living within the Holy Spirit. So that represents green shoots and growth in this kind of summer. 
you know, I could come up with lots of reasons it could be, but I, I don't have chapter and verse why it isn't. Yeah. Well, but people, I, go on, you go. Well, people also ask, you know, why I keep on changing the, 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 the Facebook colours. And I must admit, it's a bit of a whim, really, uh, because there's nothing prescriptive about them. Uh, well, in, in that, there is and there isn't, because it is in the common uh, uh, worship uh, lectionary, and that the colours are actually uh, indicated. I don't know how. I don't know how prescriptive they are. What if a church didn't follow? I think them? if you're going to do it, then you do it, and if you're a church that doesn't notice, then you don't pay attention to it. I don't think there are um common worship liturgical color police that will come around and tell you off and lots of places for example my curacy church their altar fronter altar frontal was multicolored with all of the different colors so you didn't keep changing it oh. um so so then they just had um the pulpit fall that was a different color so they would change that but the whole lot didn't um, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to disagree with Glyn and say I think the colours are really important and I love the changing of colour. And I, so I grew up in a church that didn't do liturgical colour. I had no idea that there was any significance between green and purple or red or white or gold at all until um, till I started to be part of a church that actually followed that, that rhythm and that pattern. And as you kind of grow with it, there is something really exciting about those changes. So as we get to the kind of innumerable Sundays after Trinity, and then we change to kingdom season, there's something really exciting about that change. And I love that sense of there's a visual backup to our rhythm of life. Mm. And you notice, even if you don't know why it's different, you notice that it's different. Um, and so for me, it, I, I love it. It's something that makes my heart sing in the way that, some of the music we only hear at Advent or Christmas does because it's really specific to that season. Um, and I love that long summer of ordinary time, just kind of, we just carry on doing the ordinary stuff. Nothing exciting happens. Then we get a saint in there somewhere and we have a festival day um, to remind ourselves it's not all green. So um, the, yeah, the color is, you know, we use all our senses in church. So the color is the way we see things differently. Um, I find it really exciting. That's the rhythm is basically the reason why I changed the Facebook colours as well because it indicates the the, the 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 circularity of things and the seasons coming and going, and the special festivities that uh, are obviously exciting when for for everybody when we get to the Advent and the and the Christmas season it doesn't matter who you are or what you believe there's always something special about that season, uh, and certainly for the church obviously. But uh, yeah, uh, and the, and the green, yeah, it's as Irwin said, it's not really that uh, that um, um, ordinary because there's a lot of learning to be done in that season usually, and deepening of your understanding of your own faith, and um, difficult things in the readings as well. So that uh, all goes together. I've got this all. Go and on. actually what you're saying about um, Christmas and Easter being important, even if you're not necessarily a church goer, I think the way that the colours reflect the long, the kind of long season of Christmas and the long season of Easter, because for everyone else, Christmas is over by Epiphany and the schools go back and we stop thinking about Christmas. But the church keeps going for a 50 day um, season. So we keep our colours. Well, everyone else around us is thinking about you know January and the same after Easter you know we we stay with the Easter colors until Pentecost mm. so I there's something there that reminds us that that it's not just those two days it's not just Christmas Day and Easter Day but actually those things have an, Im, an implication in it and an impact much more deeply and widely than the kind of um, commercial celebration. Are you convinced Glenn? Um, well I think it's I think it just shows that everybody's different. And I might very well anyway be in a, in a minority, but I think that, I don't know, perhaps it depends if you're more of a visual person, mm. I tend to be more kind of, I, I get the same idea of the continuity of the, of, the, of the season. Say, as you say, for Christmas, it doesn't, isn't just a couple of days. 
but I get that from the, you know, from the from the liturgy that we use in in that period and the, the words the words that we say rather than thinking too much about the about the cause. Mm, yeah. Right. Well, there's so much for colours. I mean, they, they seem fairly trivial, but then when you start thinking and talking about them, there's a, a whole lot of the background to them. So that's the first one. Now, try again with Erin, picking him, pick him up uh, on, the, on the second one uh, about the uh, eternal life question. There's another question. I have a look at my laptop. Do you really believe in eternal life and wouldn't you get bored? Well, eternal life is a bit of a difficult concept. I would prefer to call it life beyond death. Because eternal is a concept that works with time. And the life after death is not time linked. There is no time after death. There is also no space. There is no gravity. As a result, there are no black eyes in, um, in the life after death. So try, and we can't imagine, but try to understand that life after death has nothing to do with time, or with space, or with gravity, or, or with any other law in physics that is applicable here on Earth. So that's the concept that you really have to think of. Now. Can you get bored? Well, if there is no time, you can't get bored. And I think we will keep very busy in a way. And again, I'm using terminology um, from this side of uh, life, the earthly life. We, we will be in the presence of God. And that will be, that will be indeed joy and a lot happening. A relationship with God very close. Some, sometimes people talk about light when they try to explain life after death. Again, that's of course an earthly concept, but it may help us to understand that we will never get bored when we reach that point. So I hope that's helpful and I hope this may indeed encourage to further this discussion. Right. I find this quite a tricky one, actually. And I had heard this before this question popped up uh, from somebody else. And apparently there is such a thing as apirophobia, which is fear of eternity. I'd never heard of that either until uh, this question came again. So who wants to say something about that? Um, shall, I, shall I go first again? Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought it was very helpful from what um, what Erwin was saying, particularly the the time time lack of time, as it were, in um, after death. I guess he was mainly talking about. And I think I had a couple of Bible quotations coming up. So in two Peter three eight. It says, with the, Lord, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day, which it really signifies, I think, um, in the presence of God, that there is time, doesn't really have any, any meaning. Um, but I think the other thing I wanted to, to add, really, was um, when we're talking about eternal life, um, Jesus says in John's Gospel, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And so I think really eternal life doesn't start when, when we die. The eternal life, which is life with God, starts when we, when we come to know God in Jesus. Um, and so the death is just one, is just it's not an end of what life it is obviously is an end of one thing and the start of something else in a way but it's this continuity that after that uh, after we die then uh, god is we know we'll probably know god in a more real and uh, or more obvious way 
but um, but it's something that starts now. So it's not some it's not really pie in the sky when you die. The Christian faith has has value and uh, meaning, and it's exciting um, day by day uh, throughout our whole life. Thanks, Glenn. Sarah, what's your thoughts? So my first thought about this question was that um, boredom is a very human idea, isn't it? There's a very human idea about our life now that we that boredom is something we would we would avoid at all costs because we must be busy and doing something and being productive or having the best times of our lives and gathering experiences. Uh, which is a very interesting way of thinking about life, isn't it? That actually it's, that there's a transactional thing there, that there's the being part of a society and a, and a way of life that says we've got to be doing something, we've got to be not bored at any cost because what would happen if we were bored? We might be left with ourselves and our own being and our own thoughts and how terrible that would be. But actually, maybe there is room for some boredom in life and maybe it isn't such a negative idea that people might think it would be, because it would give it gives us in this earthly life a capacity for thought and for space for being with God. Um, so that was my first thought. And then, of course, thinking about boredom in whatever eternal life looks like, we won't have those human ideas. I'm very much hoping that my idea of heaven will be where everything makes sense and that everybody is equal and that all these different uh, ways of being of um, treating people like commodities that have to be used and productive will, won't be there. So it won't be a concept anyway, because none of that stuff that we've created here on earth will matter. Um, and those things about time are very important too, aren't they? That our time idea of time is relative. Um, if I'm waiting for that important phone call, and someone tells me they'll phone me back in half an hour and they take an hour to ring that other 30 minutes takes about four years to happen doesn't it our time <laughs> is really subjective so the verse that glenn gave us that a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day really just helps shape that sense that what we might think would be an interminable amount of time if such thing existed in that space wouldn't wouldn't be a burden and boredom is not it is a burden on our souls if we decide to take it that way and I don't think we'll have that stuff I don't think our life after death will have any of those things that are part of a broken world so that's my thought on that mm. well I find it quite a, a difficult subject to get my head around and uh, not even uh, trying to come at it from a religious point of view, because I haven't got that sort of training. But uh, the very thought that something goes on and on and on and on without end is, I can understand why people are a bit frightened about that, because we are used to thinking in, um, in linearly, and there is a beginning and an end to everything that we experience and we simply can't get our human brain around the idea of no limits so the limitness the limitlessness of the whole thing is something that you can only understand in terms of god because he is forever always has been always will be and that is something that helps but not everyone because you would have to have some acceptance of the religious idea would you not how difficult can it be for people who haven't got religion i think yeah. eternity and forever are just difficult concepts for anybody to get their head around aren't they like you say that um you know, when you think about the potential, like the infinite space that is the universe, mm. um, my brain gets a bit fried when I try and think about what infinity means. Like, there's, you know, there's, there's no end to this. So if we think about it in terms of 
the, the, the spatial dimensions and the time dimension is also difficult to get our heads around. So I think we're quite lucky really that we don't have to understand it in a rational way. Um, I, I would, you know, I can chalk it up to being one of the mysteries. Yes. Yeah, that, there are things that we simply can't understand with our human brain. That's the end of it, I think. Although people, there are people who are insist that the more we develop, the more we understand, and the more the mysteries will go away. But I'm not sure about this one. No, and and I think that the reassurance that we have that there will be no more pain and no more tears and no more crying in whatever our concept of heaven is that really strongly says to me that that actually these things won't matter um and whatever whatever someone's idea of heaven is the things that we have as preoccupations here won't matter so Marika you will probably understand this but I have often said you know if there are no dogs in heaven I'm not going <laughs> It said the same thing. But yeah. actually, I'm hoping I won't. Ma it won't matter. So all those questions about well, who, which family members will I be reunited with, um, who might I see? I, I don't think that they are of key importance because I don't think they will matter when we get that other side and we're with God and we can see Him face to face. Um, I think I think I remember right that it says somewhere in the Bible that in in uh, there won't be uh, uh, marriages or being given in marriage in mm. heaven. Yes, yeah, Jesus said that. Yeah, when yeah. somebody asked him, um, or that uh, gave a little story about a person who basically married seven wives one after the other, and then in in heaven, who uh, who would his wife be? Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's when he says you know, there's no no marriage basically in heaven. Yeah, yeah. Big, big Lynn is right, isn't it? Aren't you that in if we focus too much on what's over there beyond that change, then we miss out what being Christian here on earth is building kingdom, worshiping God, sharing the good news, doing the best that we can to walk with Christ as we walk through our ordinary life whether that's in the season of Lent or the season of ordinary time um I've often been a bit wary of thinking too much about uh, of placing too much emphasis on what happens when we die because we've got quite a lot of life to get through here um and I'd much rather paying attention to what makes people's life better more holy more important more valued today than what's going to happen later Right. Or not. Well, yes, indeed. But that's a whole new subject. Yes, it so, is, isn't it? And I've gone off topic quite well there. Sorry. Yeah, some, somebody might ask a question that uh, it would be relevant to that. Well, that, that was quite a lot of thinking and, and uh, answering. Thank you ever so much, uh, panel. <laughs> it's, uh, I'll try and get the uh, video sorted. In, in the edit of the recording and um, thank you for the answers and we hope that if you're watching this that you've also found it enlightening do keep the questions coming but for now goodbye goodbye bye